doggies how their tails go, eh? the most amazing day today. It's spring, but it's boiling hot. It's only 9.30 and the sun is shining and there's barely clouds in the sky. Tim has taken a bunch of kids out into the forest today. It's a new thing we're doing called a learning collective and it's two days a week, just getting kids together and just going off and having adventures or hanging around here. So that's kind of fun. I'll keep you updated with how that goes. I thought I'd just show you some of the amazing spring things going on. So this is our plum tree, which is huge. So all the blossom came out and then we had a massive hailstorm. Look at them all over the deck. They're massive, eh? Are they yum? Yeah. What do they taste like? Mm. They taste like snow. Uh-huh. <gasps> and kind of bruised and got rid of heaps of the blossoms. If every one of those flowers becomes a plum, that's epic. One of the things we've been working on the last month is a big, or well not big, but a blueberry thing. A blueberry patch. But they're kind of like hedges. We've got two rows. This row leads up to the mud kitchen and this row is down there. We were given these plants by a local blueberry farmer because they grow so well, when you trim them, you can just put the branches straight into the ground. So um, him and another lady, another blueberry farmer, bought us a whole bunch of them. And they told us that they grow really well when you dig a swale, which is basically a kind of channel before the plant so that it, it gathers heaps of rainwater and keeps heaps of the nutrients in there. Our strawberry patch is looking pretty epic up there and our spinach and kale. And the other gardens up there, I did some no dig beds, are looking like they're gonna be ready for some late spring plantings. That's pretty cool. There's so many fun things happening on a farm. I reckon spring is maybe my favorite season because it's just all on, it's so busy. On a day like today, you just feel like anything is possible. Like the world is just our oyster. While I'm walking around too, I thought it'd be quite cool to share with you 10 things I wish I'd known before we bought a massive block of land and tried homesteading. <laughs> Number one is I don't think I fully estimated how hard a road it would be to getting really comfortable. So I'd say right now, our life is actually really quite comfortable. Like we've just finished winter and we barely even noticed it was winter. We were really quite toasty. The fire kept us warm. We have a driveway all the way up to the yurts. Obviously we've also got a hot tub. And just those few little things that have meant that this winter's been really easy. And it's actually easy to forget how hard it was to get to this point. I would say we had like a full two and a half years of gnarliness. Just like working really hard, being quite transient, having loads of unknowns, practically it being really tricky, like not having driveways and being surrounded by mud, not having a fire in a cold winter, and then not having proper firewood. There were definitely times in that first couple of years where we were like, what are we doing? and why are we doing it to ourselves? And now it feels like we're really kind of reaping the benefits of that gnarliness, but I definitely underestimated it. That little squiggle there is our latest calf, about 15 hours old. Ramona actually watched it come out and you're just enjoying it from the primo view right here, eh? It's already lifting its head up. Mama? Mm -hmm. Mama, look at it! <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you see that yellow hoo? It's got yellow hooves. And the mama is doing a good job of licking it to get it up breathing. I know what was it like seeing it being born? It was um when it was like just its head coming out, just about its head, it was just like pop. Thank you. So funny. Can you look? Get used to. This guy's looking good. 
This brings me to the second one. I wish I'd known perhaps quite how much mental energy having so many animals would take up and also the thing is when you've got this much land we've got 25 acres you actually really really do need to have animals otherwise you'd be spending hours and hours lawn mowing and also using up petrol to mow the lawn <laughs> so it really makes no sense to not have animals raising these happy beautiful organic ethical cows on our fields allows us to eat really sustainably and really locally as well. So we feel really good having animals, but at certain times of the year, such as winter when we're trying to manage the grass really well, or when they're carving like right now, it takes up so much of your brain and your life. <laughs> and I think I probably did underestimate that. I'm just hanging out down in the paddock because our latest calf, it's three days old, had like a kind of like a butt plug of poo yesterday so Rowan and Tim poked that out and we're just making sure it's gonna do a little poo so I'm on poo watch right now so I'm sitting here these teenager cows are so curious and this one is the big mama cow the oldest of the bunch and that's the calf over there that I'm on poo watch for I've been here a couple of hours and so far no poo or feed. Just like jeepers, we don't need another cow drama. Also, weeds. Ugh. I reckon we've probably collectively, the people on the farm and with the weed camp that we ran this year, we've probably spent collectively over a thousand hours tackling blackberry, honeysuckle and gorse. So these are three things that were introduced by the colonialists that now just overtake any native plant. This was what we called honeysuckle corner. We dug out all the honeysuckle and we've laid carpet so that it doesn't grow back and we've planted harakeke so we've transformed it from Honeysuckle corner to Harakeke corner, which is a kind of which is a beautiful flax plant. It is a constant battle dealing with the weeds on this place. Ah! Also, with the weed busting and the animals and things, um, you can't just take a little bit of a break. You can't just go, oh, let's just take it easy this year. It's all so relentless, partly because the weeds keep coming back, but also very much because of all the rape. We own the land, but still to our council, we have to give them thousands of dollars every year just to be here. So you can't really just pop your home up and chill. You actually do have to have a little bit of a productivity lens. You have to look, keep looking at your land and be like, how can we be productive? How can we be responsible with this land? And how can we pay our rates? I guess a little bit of us thought that owning land and doing what we want to do on the land and being off grid and being sustainable and loving the earth, we thought all of that would keep us really happy and would bring into check the nomadic spirit that Tim and I have. But it actually hasn't. We love being here. This land and this community is everything to us. We're so happy and we so love it and still we have this desire to travel to see new things to meet new people to say yes to random opportunities that happen we absolutely thrive on that it helps us feel alive and basically since living on our land I've been like oh that's such a terrible instinct we have for travel and then I read a quote recently about how the urge to travel is basically like the human need to vision quest because the same thing happens like when you're going to a new place and everything feels alive and tingly with newness and freshness. It does the same thing as a kind of vision quest does. It opens your mind and you can be really expansive and see things in a new way in a new light. And when I read that I was like, okay, I don't need to stress about my nomadic spirit. I just need to find really healthy ways to kind of indulge it and meet that need that we've got. Which brings me to number six. And at this point, I'm gonna veer slightly away from things I'd wish I'd known to things that I thought I knew that did actually turn out to be correct. <laughs> so that brings me to number six, which is about community. 
when we first got to New Zealand we just thought yeah we'll get loads of acres of land and live off the land and da 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 and then we woofed for a while we volunteered for a while on somebody else's farm and we were like wow Nelly this is a lot of work and at that point we realized that we couldn't do it by ourselves we didn't want to do it by ourselves we wanted to do it with friends and family and so that at that point we started engaging with a family that we share this land with about co-owning a farm and we are so glad we did it was the best decision ever sure it is actually really really hard sharing land with people there's constant decisions to make we put hours every week into talking things through but there are so many benefits we've grown so close to this other family they've moved from friends to family now we love them so much we're there for each other we really support each other. We're able to go away for weeks and even months next year and know that the farm is in good hands and that people are gonna be taking care of it. And vice versa, when they wanna do their big adventure, we can do, we can be here on the land for them. And together, co-owning this land, we have done so much. As I've been walking, I've been walking through our tree planting area that you might remember from other videos. We've had two big planting days and so far we've got 1400 trees in in August alone and we've got another 600 to go before the planting season is over. And I'm almost certain that that is a project that we never would have been able to do if we weren't living in community. All these beautiful little saplings lining the river. I reckon the 4000 tree project so all of this tree planting has been one of the coolest things I've done in my life. I love the actual planting days and I love that we're just planting more trees, something the world really really needs. When we were first considering the idea of buying land and not a house we felt like we wanted enough land so that we could hold a festival on the land. <laughs> it's pretty random but we sort of always imagined that we would run an amazing family festival one time. I don't know if we are ever going to actually run a festival <laughs> but we could in theory and definitely having this much land is so filled with potential and that's the instinct that we had that has turned out to be true. So we have run big family camps for life learners we've had big full moon parties we run this like kids nature club and it really does feel like anything could happen here that it's a place filled with abundant potential and boundless opportunities I also had a sense that owning a bit of land like this would allow me to delve into my own wildness more that I'd be able to really be free and kind of find myself in relation to the community of nature all around me and that is a hundred percent what has happened. I love that every night I go outside and look up at the moon and the stars and I spot the different constellations and know intimately the waxing and the waning of the moon. All of that has just unfolded so naturally and is something that I knew would happen and has happened and that is so, so cool. Tim and I also had a sense that before buying this land that owning a big bit of land like this would also meet that need for adventure, that the whole thing would just be a big adventure, that every day would feel like an adventure and that is absolutely true. <laughs> every day, every week something unpredictable will happen or will be cool to learn about a whole new area. The whole thing has just been such a steep adventurous learning curve and it's definitely brought Tim and I closer and it's really felt like we're just on this epic voyage together being here. So that's been pretty cool. <laughs> and our last one, number 10, something we kind of thought we knew before we moved here was that this was right for us. We just kind of knew on some level that this was the next phase in our life together and it absolutely has been the best choice for us, the best decision we could have made. And I don't think it's going to be everybody's best decision. I don't think it's going to be right for everyone and all of us are just called to spend enough time with ourselves, getting to know ourselves and our urges and loving ourselves to know what the next step is for us and what the next 
phase of our life looks like. There's an amazing quote, and I can't remember who it's by, but it says something like, pay attention and your heart will show you the way. And I so just believe in that. If we have enough time being still, enough time to listen to ourselves, enough time to be present and not hurried by external things, enough time separate from culture around us, enough time away from YouTube and Instagram, our hearts will lead us to the right place. I hope that you find your right spot. <laughs> I'm back at the yurt now. That was a little spring tour. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing, you're awesome. If you want to keep in touch with me, read more of my writing, tap into some live streams, you can check out my Patreon, link below. Wherever you are in the world, much love to you and stay radical. Mwah.